Okay, so uh, here we go, second part, all right? So what we talked about what we talked about previously was trying to estimate the bandwidth of a two points, so a narrow band and a single tone signal through frequency modulation, all right? So the bandwidth of that is just simply twice the uh, frequency of your cosine, which is great, all right? But we want to go a little more general. We, don't, we just don't want to do it for single tone. We want to do it for any general message that you'll encounter in practice, okay? So, so far, all we've done was determine what the spectrum is and what the bandwidth is of a single tone modulated narrow band frequency modulated signal. So, remember, we stated previously that if you wanted to see what the spectrum was for more general cases or for any general message signal, it's not, fortunately, it's not easy. Okay? So, let's consider a more general case where the message signal is just any arbitrary signal we're going to look at, okay? So we're also going to let A of T be the integral. So this is just the integral of your message, right? So what we're going to do is, this is our frequency modulated signal. This is the, the thing that we have before. This is also just 2 pi FC, okay? But we're going to use omega C just for notational convenience. I don't want to keep writing 2 pi FC. It's just omega C, all right? And then we're going to replace the integral of your message with just A of T, okay? We're going to do this for notational convenience because we're going to see what, you know, um, what, this, this will help you in terms of expressing what the bandwidth is later. Okay? Okay. So, um, this is going to take about a, this is going to take a leap of faith, but just, just trust me on this, alright? So, this is, so we can also express your frequency modulated signal as this. So, this is what we had so far. Okay? And then, if you remember, uh, or this formula, all right, so e to the jx is equal to cos x plus j sine of x, okay? Also, if you wanted to just get the cosine part out, you just extract the real component of e to the jx, right? So remember, this is the real component, this is the real component, and then this is the imaginary component. So I can represent cos of x as the real of the Euler's formula, okay? And that's what's happening right here. So you can represent this as x, and then here, and then this is ac, so this would be real of ac e to the jx. Okay, so that's what's happening right now here. Okay, just go with me on this, and I'm going to talk about why this is actually important. Okay, a of c. Okay, so x is equal to this whole thing over here. And this is e to the j of x, so the real component of that portion, okay? Now, this one looks a little odd, but this goes way back to calculus 2, okay? If you remember what the Taylor series was, you can actually approximate the exponential in terms of a Taylor series. I'm not going to drive it for you, but you can simply replace this as, you know, x to the power n over n factorial, okay? So this is actually how your calculators do it. If you ever wondered how exactly they calculated cos or sine or whatever, they actually use Taylor series up to a certain decimal approximation. And it's just basically a weighted sum of polynomials. So this is actually how cosine, sine, and hyperbolic 10, and exponential, this, this is actually how it's done on calculators. They use a rudimentary version of Taylor series to do that for you. Okay? So this is e to the x, all right? So what, what this portion here is, is that we're representing this in terms of a Taylor series. So this is a Taylor series. Okay, so that's what's happening over here. Okay, so this is actually, so this, if you write it out, it's 1, right, plus x, plus x squared over 2, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is 1 plus jx, right, plus j squared, x squared over 2, and so on and so forth. Okay, where x is equal to this guy over here. So if you substitute x here and here, this is the resulting stuff that you get. So j squared is minus 1 and so on and so forth, right? So that's, so, you know, it, it, you know, it's getting a little messy right now, but it's very, very manageable. So you start off with your frequency modulated wave, and then you represent the integral as a, and then you let cos of x equal, you know, ac e to the jx or whatever, and then this is ac here, so that's what's happening. And then you're going to represent e to the whatever as a Taylor series, right? So this is 1 plus, and then you have jx, and then plus j squared, and so on and so forth. Okay, and then what's happening here? It's actually not x. I'm sorry. So what's happening here is that this is uh, k of f, and then the uh, e to the j omega e, uh, c is actually factored out. So what's happening here? Let me just sorry. Let me just cross that out. So that's actually not what's happening here. What's happening here is that we're splitting this up. So you have e to the j omega c and e to the j k f a of t, 
And then this is, I'm going to call this y, and that's what's happening here in the substitution. So 1 plus, you know, uh, y plus uh, y squared over 2 factorial, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is y, right, and this is y squared over 2, and so on and so forth. And that's what's happening here. Okay, now when you multiply this by e to the j, right, this becomes cos of omega ct plus j sine omega ct. Okay, so if you do this multiplication and you've extract out the real portions only, then the final expression you get is here. Okay, just take my word for it. So it makes sense because you have 1. So you're going to have e to the j omega ct times 1. So that's cos plus j sine. You extract out the real, you only get the cosine term. Now if you do j k f a of t times and then e to the j omega ct, you're going to have j of cos and then k f a t and then times j of sine. So the j becomes squared becomes minus 1. You get the real part and that's what you get over here. So when you multiply by e to the j omega ct, you calculate the real portion. This is what you get. Okay, so this is actually very significant. Okay, so why? So basically what we're doing here is that your frequency modulated signal is actually an infinite summation of terms, right? So you can actually probably see where this is going to give us some problems in terms of the bandwidth, all right? So this is the term we had well. So remember, um, so this is your frequency modulated wave. So A of T, this is just the integral of your message, right? So the integral of your message is the bandwidth doesn't change, right? Because the non-zero elements, you know, between, you know, wherever it's bounded, the bandwidth does not change when you take the integral. Okay, so this doesn't change uh, bandwidth, all right? So assuming that your message is band limited by B sub M hertz, right? So when you take a look at your frequency modulated wave, okay, you have one portion here, so this contributes B of M hertz to your signal, okay? Now, if you take a look at this guy, this is equal to a squared, which is basically a times a. And if you remember, when you're taking a look at bandwidth, when you multiply in time, you convolve in frequency. And when you're convolving two signals together, the width of the two signals add up. Right? So in this case, both of these are equal to bm. So if you convolve them together, you get twice the bandwidth. Right? And that's what's going on over here. So the a squared term gives you twice the bandwidth. And then if you take a look, this is a Taylor series. So there's a cube term. There's a fourth term, right? So this is twice the bandwidth, and then this is three times the bandwidth, and then as you see here, because this is an infinite series, right, this technically would mean that your bandwidth is infinite, and that is not good, unfortunately, right? Because remember, this, you can represent your frequency modulated signal as a summation of terms that are proportional to your message signal. Okay, so you have a and then a squared, where a is just the integral of your message. And then remember that you can represent this as an infinite series. So because this is an infinite series, technically you need an infinite number of terms to satisfy this requirement. And that means, unfortunately, that you're going to need, uh, your bandwidth is unfortunately infinite. So that, um, that's not very good. Theoretically, this is not good. So remember, for amplitude modulation, the bandwidth is just twice your message, twice the message of your, twice the uh, uh, bandwidth of your message signal. But then when you take a look at frequency domain, the bandwidth is actually infinite. And that's that's not very good. So how exactly can we go how exactly can we go around this? Or what are what are certain things we can exploit to make it so that it's not infinite anymore? Right? So here, this is what I want to talk about. So the bandwidth, you know, the frequency modulated signal, the bandwidth is not band limited. It's technically infinite. Alright? So Okay, so let's go back and just do the narrow bandwidth. Just, just let's take a look at the narrow band uh, frequency case, just to be sure. Okay, so the modulation in X is simply your frequency deviation. So this here is delta F. Okay, and then this is divided by your frequency. The, uh, I guess the uh, for the single tone case, this is just the uh, message frequency or the uh, frequency of your cosine wave for your message. Okay, so if this is small, okay. This implies that your constant is small. So usually the message signal you can't change. Usually the frequency you can't change, but this you can change. This is actually customizable. So this you can change. So if you can change this, right, and if the deviation is small or the modulation index is small, that means your sensitivity is going to be small too. So you can actually adjust the sensitivity depending on your purposes. But the smaller it is, the more narrow band your message is going to be. Okay. So if this is very small, then what we can do is that we can do basically what's known as a linear approximation. So for higher order terms, 
if you square, so if we know that this is small, and if you square this, or if you cube this, and if you keep going, those numbers are actually going to be very small. So you can consider these as being negligible, right? Because if this is a very small number, if you square it, or if you cube it, or if you take it to the power of 4, they will become even smaller. So if you make this small, then you can consider these as negligible. You can cancel these out, and you're just left with these two terms. Okay. Assuming that, you know, as you take the squaring or the cubing operation, it's, you know, it's going to be, you know, this is larger than, you know, those three, assuming that it's small. So for the narrow band case, all right, if we're doing single tone modulation, we actually get this result, which is actually what we've derived previously. Okay. So A of T is simply, you know, the integral of your message, right? Or not alpha, we can do lambda, I guess. Okay. And then we know that that's simply a sign. So this is sine of omega m t over omega m, 0 to t. And then when you plug that in, that's the result we get before from uh, narrow band modulation. So this correlates to what we've talked about in terms of narrow band. Okay? And then this is why that block diagram I showed you requires that you take the integral first, you know, a of t, and then you multiply by a c sine, and then you subtract with co. So, that's, so now if you actually remember that block diagram of how you actually generate a narrow band frequency modulated signal. If you look at this equation, now that block diagram makes sense. Right? Oops, let me, uh, oh, sorry. Get rid of that, sorry. I don't like those stray marks. Okay, so bandwidth estimation continued. Okay, so for a narrow band modulated signal, okay, just like the single tone uh, uh, case, for any general message signal, provided that it's narrow band, which means that the you know modulation index should be 0.3 or less, if it is narrow band, then all you have to do is just simply take twice the bandwidth of your signal, and um, that's uh, oh, sorry, you're not your signal, your message signal, and that's really all it is. Okay, so the bandwidth of the integral of your message is the same as the message itself, so it's just twice the bandwidth, which is you know which is nice. Okay, so we've already determined that from before, assuming it's narrow band. Okay, so as we will show later, right, this result for narrow band frequency modulated signals is valid for all narrow band frequency modulated signals generated by band limited modulating signals, right? So that means that, um, let me, so let me see here. So that means that uh, if your message signal is band limited and if it's narrow band, then your resulting frequency modulated signal will also be narrow band as well, okay? Okay, so. Um, we're going to estimate, so this is basically, I'm going to talk about how you actually approximate the bandwidth now. So technically the bandwidth was infinite, right? But we're going to go through some derivations on how you can actually get a tangible number. So instead of it being an infinite number, this will give you an approximation of what that bandwidth will be, okay? So think about it this way. So remember that um, when you take a look at the instantaneous frequency at certain points in time for your message, you are changing the you know, the frequency of your mess of, of the carrier message, you know, of your carrier signal, depending on what your message is, right? So what we can do is, let's take your message signal and break it up into very tiny boxes, where each box is a very small width that is adjusted by the height of your message, okay? So you can think of this as, you know, think of your message signal as a bunch of boxes That uh, that are at the height of the message. Okay, and the message is and the actual width is very small. So the width is small. So you can think of this as kind of sampling, right? So you want to make sure that you are the width of your pulse is equal to the Nyquist, right? So remember, so twice the bandwidth is the Nyquist frequency. So this is the Nyquist frequency. Not Nyquist frequency, it's a sampling frequency. So that's a sampling frequency. If you want to determine the right interval, how often you should sample a particular signal, it's just one over that, right? So TS is just one over FS, which is one over two B of M, right? So well, let's assume now we're actually sampling this signal, and this is the interval you need to properly reconstruct if you put a low pass filter in. Okay. So how exactly would this look like in terms of the spectrum? So what we're going to do is we're going to, so remember at each point in time, you can think of these as rect functions that are happening at every point in time and with a certain height. Okay, so what exactly would this look like in terms of the spectrum? So you can think, remember, each of these rect functions would basically be a sync. So you have a collection of different sync functions, right? So 
So remember, this you can represent this as a rectangular fault pulse. So this is rect of T over tau. Okay. So the Fourier transform of this, you can either do it in F or omega. We're just going to do F for now. So this is the Fourier transform representation of the, you know, of that rec function, right? And this with tau here, right? So remember the the width between here and here and tau, and we've determined this to be one over two bm. Okay. So when you take a look at the sig function, the width of the main side lobe between here and here is simply two bm. Okay, or it's one over tau. So that's just that's just a property of a sig function. Okay. So you can probably think of what's going to happen when you actually take a look at what the spectrum of this is going to look like. What's going to happen is that you're basically going to have a whole bunch of sync functions that are translated and shifted depending on where this, you know, um, where the, uh, where, you know, where each of these uh, boxes appear. Okay. So let's actually take a look at what that looks like. All right. So at this, so remember, you can, remember, you can think of this as breaking up your signal into a bunch of rectangular functions. So remember, at each point in time. Uh, you're going to have some box with a, so this box here will give you your carrier at a certain frequency. So, you know, the frequency here is constant between this point and this point. Okay. So, so uh, let's see here. So you can think of this, all right, as putting a rect function on a cosine wave. Okay. So when you have, you know, when you have this rect function, you know, when you have this rectangular function, okay, the frequency modulated signal. So what's happening here is that, no, this is what the instantaneous frequency looks like. Okay, and then the signal that we're, you know, we're trying to, mod you know, the signal that is actually appearing is basically, you know, this is your, you know, this is a cosine wave, and then you're actually multiplying it by different rect functions. So this is a cosine wave with uh, multiple rect functions added together. So that's what's happening here. So we have some, you know, we have a cosine wave, and then what's happening is that we are splitting up into multiple chunks of cosines and adding them up all together when we're done. Okay. So this is your frequency modulated signal. All right. So um, let's see here. So let me see. So this is your message. All right. You can think of your message as, you know, the, uh, you know, as as just a rect function, and then you take the Fourier transform of your message, you know, of the actual, you know, frequency modulated signal. Right, so this you can think of this as your frequency modulated signal. You take different Fourier transforms, you're going to get you know a bunch of sync functions. So here's one sync function, and this is at this point in time. All right, and then as you start increasing the uh, frequencies, right between different, then you, what's going to happen is that they keep getting shifted. So at this point in time, right, what's going to happen is that remember, so at you know depending on what frequency this is. So remember, this frequency is actually getting larger. So remember this, you know, the frequency at you know. T sub k, which is right here, is going to be less than the frequency at this point. Okay. So as the frequency starts to increase, then this sync function translates over to the right. So that's what's happening here, right? So f of k plus one is going to be greater than f of k. That's why it translates. So as you start increasing in amplitude, your sync functions are going to be pushed more all the way out to the right because you know your frequencies start to increase. And then after this point, when you start to decrease the amplitude, then these sync functions are going to be pushed to the left. All right. So that's actually what's happening now. So as you start decreasing your the height of the you know of the actual rect functions, the sync functions they keep they keep getting pushed to the left. Right. So that actually starts to make sense here. And then you get to the point where you're at this point here, or you know you know it doesn't really decrease anymore. And then when you start to increase the you know, magnitude, increase the actual message, the frequency starts to increase again. So that's what's happening at this point, right? So this would be, you know, the minimum point where you'd expect it to stop, right? So this here would be the minimum point, right? And then what we talked about here, you know, at the very point was the maximum. So this here is the smallest frequency you would expect, okay? And then this point here will be the largest frequency that you expect, and that's coinciding with this point over here, okay? So if you were to use, you know, rect functions, so if you were to, uh, you know, we can actually approximate, you know, this metric signal is a bunch of rect functions together, all right? If you wanted to approximate what your bandwidth of your message is, all you have to do is figure out the minimum between, you know, here and here, right? So the minimum and maximum. But you also count the side lobes as well, right? So you're also, you actually have to count the side lobes, you know, as well to make sure that you get everything. So the actual bandwidth is simply between here and here. So this would be, be this would be the bandwidth of your signal. Okay. So it's basically you're going to take so two bm. So between here and here, 
right, is 2 BM. So you have to take your minimum and maximum, and then you also have to add these two as well to make sure that you account for the total width. So the actual bandwidth is going to be F max minus F min, and then you have to add twice the width of each side lobe. Okay, so you have, so the maximum appears, you know, minimum maximum here, and then you also have to account for the side lobes for each, and then each of these is 2 BM, right? So you have to account for each of those. So you can approximate the bandwidth like that, and that's actually what you can do instead, okay? So if you were to, you know, as you make the width of these rect functions smaller, then of course you're going to approach an infinite bandwidth, but assume that we have our signal and we can actually you represent it as a bunch of rect functions that are very, very small in terms of width. If you do that instead, then what you can do is you can actually represent the bandwidth approximately using this equation here. So you take the difference between the max and the min, and then you also have to account for each of the side lobes, which is why you have to do twice the width, or which is twi you know, twice the bandwidth. Okay? So here's just a general observation, all right? So this is our message signal, okay? This is the frequency modulated signal. Okay, and this is what the spectrum looks like. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, f of f. All right, so the bandwidth is simply, you know, the difference between the, you know, between the, uh, you know, the minimum and maximum plus the respective side lobes. All right, so if you wanted to figure out what the minimum deviation is, it's very simple, right? Remember, all you have to do is remember this is this is the instantaneous frequency, right? It's uh, Fc plus and then Kf over uh, 2 pi, and then m of t, all right? If you want to figure out what the smallest frequency is, all you have to do is, if you want to find f min, you just have to, so you just have to figure out what the smallest value of your message signal would be, and then that'll give you what the you know, peak would be. So uh, in this case, assuming that this is symmetric, so we're going to assume that this is symmetric, right? So this is going to go from positive MP to negative MP, okay? So the smallest point at any time in your message is simply just the negative of the largest peak, and that's what's happening over here. So the minimum frequency that you'll see is simply your carrier, and then you're adding an additional offset, which is determined by the negative of your message signal, and that's what, that's what this is doing here. And then if, similarly, if you want to figure out what the maximum point is, it's just you're adding a plus instead, okay? So if you want to determine what the bandwidth of your uh, frequency modulated signal would be, you just simply take the max, right, subtract the min, and then you're adding twice the, you know, the twice the twice the bandwidth, or two times, you know, two times two the bandwidth. Okay? So if you subtract these two things together, the FCs cancel, and then you'll get this minus this, which gives you twice that much here. Okay, so twice that. And then remember we can represent this as delta F. All right? In this case, this general, you know, this observation means that instead of using A of M, you can use the largest peak instead. So we can use this as the deviation instead. Okay? So you can represent this as delta F and you get that. And you can also factor out a 2 and you get this. So this would be the bandwidth, the approximate bandwidth of your signal. Okay. So that's actually not bad. So this is the formula that you would use. But there's something wrong with this, and I'll show you uh, very soon. Okay? So... This is what we talked about before, all right? But this approximation is not a very good one, okay? Basically, remember what we talked about was for the narrow band case, we're assuming that beta is less than 0 0.3, which means that the deviation should approximately approach 0. If this is the case, if you do this, what's going to happen is that your bandwidth of your frequency modulated signal is actually going to be 4 times the bandwidth. But we already established for the narrow band case that it's twice the bandwidth. It's not four times. So what you do instead is you just basically chop off that two, and that would be the approximation. And that's what's known as Carson's rule. Okay? So this approximation is good, but if you let the you know, frequency deviation approach zero, which is the narrow band case, then you're going to get two times two times the bandwidth for the narrow band, which is four. And that doesn't make any sense. Okay? You actually, we established that the bandwidth has to be twice, not four. So just chop off the two, and then that's your, there's your approximation. That's the final rule that you use. Okay? So a better rule is one that's known as Carson's rule. So basically get rid of the two, right? There's no more two there, and this would be the equation that you use. So 
this would be the approximation of the bandwidth of your signal. And this is what's used as Carson's rule. So actually, this rule actually underestimates the bandwidth by a little bit. It depends on uh, certain circumstances. It can underestimate by 10%. It can even go under 20%, if you, if you will. So, don't, so this is an approximation. It doesn't actually give you the final bandwidth. Theoretically, it's infinite. But uh, this gives you a good starting point in what the actual bandwidth of your message, uh, bandwidth of your frequency modulated signal would be. So this is what is known as Carson's rule. So you just do twice the frequency deviation. In this case, this is KF MP over uh, two pi. Okay. So this is delta F, and then the bandwidth of your message, whatever that, whatever that is, depending, you know, whatever, whatever you measure that out to be. So that's what's known as Carson's rule. Okay, so here are just some similarities between, uh, no, not similarities, but here, here we're going to talk about uh, different cases depending on if you're looking at narrow band or the general case, which is wide band, which is not narrow band. Okay, so this is what's known as Carson's rule, and then we're going to define the modulation next we talked about before. So, um, and here, this is for a single tone. All right, so this is just for single tone. This is what's known as, so using the modulation index is defined for single tone only. Okay. In general, if you don't have a cosine as the message signal, you use what is known as the deviation index, and it's actually just the same thing. So instead of using FM, you're going to use the bandwidth of your message instead. So instead of beta, you use capital D. And it's pretty much the same thing. It's just modulation index is used for single tone, and this is used for general message signals. Okay, so uh, it just depends on what circumstance you're looking at. Okay. All right, so yeah, so it talks about for single tone only. So uh, for single tone modulation, all right, um, what you can do is you can represent this. So remember, this is, um, you know, 2 delta F plus B of M. So this is Carson's rule. Now, if I factor out a B of M, okay, what's going to happen is I'm going to get delta F over B of M plus 1, okay? And we've defined this to be your uh, modulation index, right? So this is actually beta or D, depending on what you're looking at, okay? And that's what's happening over here. So for single tone modulation, B of M is actually equal to the frequency of your cosine wave, that's, you know, that's the Nyquist frequency, and then that gets substituted into here, which is what you get over here. And then for wideband, wideband is not narrow band, so for all the other general cases, okay, you just replace the beta with the D instead, and that's totally fine. So this, so this, as well as this representation are both one and the same. So this is equal to that. So what are, whatever representation you want to use is totally fine. You can use this representation or this representation or even this one. They're both equal to Carson's rule. All right? Okay, so let me see here. I think I've got, I got enough time to cover this and I'll go ahead and do the tutorial, all right? So determining a closed form expression for the spectrum of your frequency modulated signal is unfortunately not possible, okay? So, well, not, not possible, but basically what I'm saying here is that um, to figure out a, you know, the, uh, the expression for the spectrum for any deviation index, so for, for any value of beta or, you know, the deviation index, finding a general expression for the Fourier transform is actually not, it's impossible, mainly because it's a, you know, it's t theoretically an infinite signal. Okay, so what we're going to do instead is we're going to take a look at the single tone modulation case. All right, so you, if you want to actually see what the spectrum looks like, you can go ahead and put it on a spectrum analyzer. But if you actually want to derive the actual expression, the Fourier transform on paper, you actually can't do that unless it's a single tone modulation case. And if it's single tone, then we can certainly do that on paper. And we're going to talk about that now. Okay, so. Uh, this is your frequency modulated signal. You know, this is you know, this expression we already know. All right. For the single tone modulation case, remember we can change this to that. This is what we derived before. All right. Also, if you remember, the real component of a c e to the j x is equal to cosine you see cos of x. Right. So you're just replacing the real component of the Euler's formula, and that's what's going on over here. Okay, so this is equal to x, and that is what is going on here. All right, and then what we can do now is remember when you take the exponent of two uh, powers that are added together, it's equal to a b times a of c, and that's what's going on over here. We're splitting up the exponents 
so that they're basically multiplied together. So that is that's just your standard, you know, um, uh, you know, ex exponent exponent property. All right. Oopsie, I skipped ahead. Let's go uh, one. Here we go. All right. So this expression here, this we can represent this as your uh, frequency modulated signal. This is for single tone. All right. So this function here, e to the jb, this stuff here, you can actually represent this as a Fourier series. So this is actually periodic. So we can actually change this and figure out what the Fourier series of this is. So remember, you can think of this as your d of n, I guess, right? Not d of n, but c of I, I, we have c of n here, but I'm going to represent this as d of n. So we're going to take a look at the Fourier series expansion of this. All right, so we can actually, this is a periodic symbol. Let's take a look at it in terms of its Fourier series. All right. Okay, so remember how you find the Fourier series, right? This, they call it C of n here, but C of n is equal to 1 over T naught, your integral over a period. Let's go from T naught over 2 to T naught over 2 without, you know, loss of generality. And then x of t, e to the minus j, n omega naught t, and then dt. Okay, so that's how you'd find the Fourier series coefficients exponent-wise. Exponent okay, so omega m is your fundamental frequency, right? So we know that t naught is going to be equal to 2 pi over omega m. And 1 over t naught is equal to omega m over 2 pi. And that's what's going on over here. Okay, so let me just, 1 over t naught equals. Okay, so that is what's going on over here. Okay, now this here is simply t naught over 2, right? Because if you divide this by 2, you just get pi over omega m, right? And this is also minus t naught over 2. So this is just finding the Fourier series coefficients. This here would be your x of t. And then you have, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, x of t. And then, you know, this is, this is what you want to find. So e to the j n omega naught. In this case, this is omega m. OK? So what's happening here is that if we do a substitution, if we let x equal omega m t, dx equals omega m d of t. Right, so then one over omega m d of x equals d of t. Okay, so that's what's happening over here. So this omega m f cancels out with that, so we get this guy over here. That's what's happening. So if you substitute x as omega m t, we get this relationship. We can also collect the terms together, and we get that. And then this guy here is a very special integral, which we'll call j n of beta. This is what are known as Bessel functions of the first kind. Okay, so if you so we actually do not integrate this by hand. There are actually tables that actually let us do this for us. Okay, so you actually do not integrate that by yourself. So what is you know this here is represented as j of n. Okay, so what exactly is this? It's what's known as a Bessel function of the first kind. Okay, so a Bessel function of the cursed fu first kind, nth order, right? And beta is the argument. So beta, this is the uh, modulation index. So the actual spectrum of your FM signal for a single tone case will depend entirely on the modulation index of your signal. Okay? So this is a Bessel function of the first kind, order n argument beta, which is their modulation index, right? So okay. So we're gonna talk about the properties very soon, but for the time being, let's assume that these are already calculated. So we're gonna these are already calculated. So we have we had some process that allowed us to calculate all these values. We have them on a table of some sort, and we're just going to assume that they're already ready for us to use. Okay, so let's let's assume that we've already calculated those. Okay, so all right, so we had this expression before. This is representing our frequency modulated signal for a single tone case. All right, single tone case. So remember, we can represent this as a Fourier series expansion, which is over here. Right, so this would be your C of n or D of n, what have you. We have this, and then we multiply these out. We got, you know, you add the two bases together, not to the, the two exponents together, we get this. And then finally, if you find the real portion of this exponential, you simply get a cos. So the um, frequency modulated signal for a single tone wave is represented by a weighted sum of Bessel coefficients of different cosine waves weighted by your carrier wave. Okay, so this is important. This is actually related to the uh, pre lab for lab number three, which, will, which I'll actually do some uh, examples for you later, but I just wanted to cover this very briefly. We're going to do more of this uh, after the midterm. 
Okay, so I'll just do a couple more slides to be sure we're comfortable, and then I'll go ahead and do the, uh, do the review, okay? So this is the representation of your frequency modulated signal for a single tone, right? And this, this is, these, are what are using known, these are what are known as Bessel coefficients, using the modulation index as an input. So if you wanted to find the Fourier transform of this, it's actually very simple, right? Remember that the Fourier transform of a cosine wave is two impulses that are centered at plus minus whatever the frequency that is defined by that cosine to be, right? So cosine omega naught t, right? If you take the Fourier transform, it's a half delta f minus f naught plus a half delta f plus. Okay, so that's what's going on here. So if you take the Fourier transform of this, this AC comes outside, which is what we have here. These constants depend on N. So you have to make sure that these stay in the summation. And then these are constants. And then you just take the Fourier transform of this guy, right? And then the Fourier transform just becomes two impulses. And notice that the factor of two comes outside over here, right? So you have two impulses that are centered at, you know, omega C plus N of omega M, or F in this case, so minus and plus. And then you also have these constants there as well. So for a single tone modulated case, depending on what your deviations are, uh, for you know, not your deviations, your modulation index, you will have a, a variety of different impulses that are you know, separated by a certain amount. Also, the heights are going to change depending on your Bessel coefficients. OK, let me just see how much time we got. Uh, all right, so OK, I'm going to, OK, I'll, let me see, I'm just seeing how much I got here. All right, so you know what? Okay, good. So I'm, I'm going to stop the properties, okay? So I'm almost done here. Okay, so this is what the spectrum of your Bessel, not Bessel, but your um, single tone modulated wave using frequency modulation would look like. So this is the expression that we found before, okay? So if you wanted to figure out what the Fourier transform would be, all right, remember that all you have to do is just substitute values of n. So this is when n is equal to 0. When n is equal to 0, you just have one impulse that is... Remember, so each of these impulses are going to be multiplied by AC over 2, okay? And then all you have to do is just keep, keep substituting values of n. So this is when n is equal to 1. And when is it n is equal to 1, you get two impulses, right? So you have uh, one that is centered at, and, you know, f of m and one that's centered at f plus, right? So minus and plus. So you get, uh, you know, this is n is equal to 1. This is n is equal to minus 1. This is n is equal to 2, n is equal to minus 2, and so on and so forth. Okay? So theoretically, this is an infinite sum, right? So there would technically be a lot, you know, there's many, many impulses that you could include. So there's got to be some way to cut off how many impulses you need, and I'm going to talk about that in the next class. Okay? So theoretically, there's an infinite number of sidebands. It's not band limited. But if you take a look at the actual, you know, modulation index, right? This value actually determines what the actual spectrum of your signal is going to look like. So the, DV, the modulation index and in turn your best cell function numbers determine what your spectrum of your frequency modulated wave for a single tone case will look like. OK, so here are some properties. So these are real valued. You're never going to get any complex values, which are nice. OK, you also have what are known as even and odd symmetry. So this means that. Um, you know, it actually, it, it, you know, the actual heights will fluctuate between negative and positive. So, uh, you know, plus will be one, and then minus will be another, and then plus, minus, plus, minus. All right? So that's actually what, what that's going to, you know, what that is. And then for the narrow band case, right, if your, if your deviation, if, you, if your modulation index is less than 0.3, then all you have are two coefficients. You're going to have one at n is equal to zero, and then you have two at uh, plus, minus one. Okay, and then anything that is larger, you just set to zero. And then normalization. So if you actually add up all the coefficients, they actually sum up to one. If you actually square them off, which uh, which is kind of cool. Okay. Uh, all right. So. Okay, so I'm just going to cover this, and then we're, we're good to go. So the, they are actually well tabulated. So if you take a look, the horizontal axis is dependent on the modulation index, which is here. Okay, so depending on what modulation index you use, for example, let's say I wanted to use 0 0.5, right? So you look down this way, you see that there are going to be only three coefficients you need. So you, this is when n is equal to 0, right? This is when n is equal to 1, and so on and so forth. So at 0 0.5, there's only three values that are going to be non-zero. So this means that you only have three pairs of impulses. Okay, 
And as you start increasing your modulation index, you're going to get more and more impulses. So for example, at 8, I'm going to have all these ones that are non-zero. Right? You're going to have uh, you know, 10 or so. So the smaller your, the smaller your, uh, DV, the smaller your modulation index, the less impulses you're going to have for your spectrum. And uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to cover. Okay? So I'll stop here, take a break, and then come back. I'll do some tutorial problems, and hopefully I'll get you guys out of here in about half an hour. All right? So uh, that's it.